So in, invasive plants are a big issue for natural resource management, whether that's on public lands or private lands. And it's something we do a lot of work on just because of that. Uh, invasive plants have been shown to reduce species diversity. So they push out our native species. Um, they may reduce the productivity of your land. So maybe um, you know, your trees grow or something like that, as well as impact wildlife habitat, ecosystem functions. There's a lot of alterations or negative impacts as a consequence of having invasive species. Um, one of the main reasons they become a problem, we think, is they're basically free from all their native pa pests or pathogens or things that kind of keep them in check in their native habitat. When they're moved to the this new habitat, they don't have those checks and balances, so they're free to grow a little more um, fast, uh, produce a little more seed uh, than they would otherwise, and that gives them that competitive edge. And so they are able to outcompete our native species and then take over. When we have a big stand of an invasive species that's just that one species, we call it a monoculture. And then we also call um, a problem when we have a population of invasive species an infestation. And so these infestations often move quickly. Um, they're a problem and so we need to manage them. You can do that a bunch of different ways, but some of the work that we do is trying to promote uh, safe, effective management techniques. We research different techniques to try to find the best one for the different species out there. It's an issue that any landowner uh, is gonna have to deal with, whether you have one acre or 500 acres. Uh, invasive species are gonna be a problem on that land, unfortunately. Probably the worst invasive plant in Southern Illinois in terms of damage is this one, Ammer Honeysuckle. You'll also hear it called Bush Honeysuckle. Uh, but this plant to me uh, is the most damaging because it can impact wildlife, it can impact your understory plants and your trees. And it doesn't really need that disturbance. It can go into really high quality forested ecosystem. So we're very concerned about it. Here it is in full flower um, in the spring. In the fall, it'll have those bright red berries on it. But again, one of the most impactful ones out there, one of the ones that I strongly encourage landowners to control and, and keep in check if they can. Um, it's pretty easy to identify. It'll have these opposite leaves. So two leaves at a time that have a long point. This time of year, the bright white or sometimes turning yellow flowers on it like that. And then it's a shrub, right? It's only 10, 15 foot tall at most. It usually has a bunch of, of stems coming out of the ground. Uh, definitely keep an eye out for this one. Um, manage it, it, managing it is important. You can do a, a couple things. Smaller bushes like this, you can actually pull them out of the ground by hand. It pulls out pretty easily. Or you can use herbicides. So you would spray the foliage uh, with something like glyphosate, or you could cut the plant down at the base and if you do that it would just sprout back unless you paint the stems that you cut with an herbicide to keep it from sprouting back. Um, prescribed fire is another effective tool that'll keep this in check a little bit. It'll at least keep it from growing as big and it'll kill small ones. So prescribed fire in a forest can be a very good thing to manage invasives, uh, particularly honeysuckle here. Another invasive that we have is Oriental Bittersweet. It's also called Round Leaf Bittersweet. And so this is a woody vine. And so most of that vine and stuff you see behind me here is all bittersweet and it's climbing up into these trees. That's really where this one gets its damage or, or where we're worried about it is it's a tree killer, right? It'll climb up into the trees. It'll either wrap, its, wrap itself around the trees and girdle them, or it'll just climb up into the branches and uh, shade the tree out or get so heavy in the tree that are literally break branches or pull them down. Um, we've had multiple ice storms the last few years, and what we found is um, trees that have a lot of bittersweet in it seem to be more susceptible to ice damage, to storm damage, because those branches are weakened, they're heavy with the bittersweet, and so we see a lot more damage uh, in a forest when there's an infestation of bittersweet. Uh, we do have a native bittersweet, but you'll never, I've, I've never seen it really get to this level of an infestation where it's choking trees out. Usually it's just one vine at a time. The other way to tell our native bittersweet apart from the oriental bittersweet, one is the oriental bittersweet has these really rounded leaves. They're almost perfectly round, where the native has more of an elongated leaf. 
And then if you see here, all the flowering on this plant, um, Oriental Bittersweet has flowers all up and down the plant like this, and it'll have fruit all up and down the plant. But the native just has the flowers and fruit right at the end. So it produces a lot less fruit. And again, just right at the end. But uh, the other thing about this plant is everywhere it touches the ground, um, it'll produce new roots. So if a vine lays along the ground, it may root five or six times. It can also send up suckers out of its root system as well. And so you get these huge patches that are connected that are really, really hard to control. And so you have to work at it and keep repeating control to try to get rid of it. Um, if you just cut it or burn it, oftentimes you get this flush of growth coming up afterwards that is just a mat of vegetation. So it's a challenge to control. It spreads easily because of the berries are moved by birds. Um, so it really is a challenge. Fortunately, there's, um, there's some bad patches in Illinois and Southern Illinois, but it's not really, really widespread. So you're not gonna find it everywhere, but when you do have it, it's certainly one to focus on because of its potential to damage your trees. Autumn olive is another invasive shrub. This one is a little different than honeysuckle or some, or, or some of the others in that it really likes the open lands. And so this is a big problem at forest edges like this, or if you have prairies, meadows, uh, fields, young tree plantings, any place with a lot of light, this species can be a problem. I've actually seen it completely take over a tree planting where uh, it ended up shading out and killing 90% of the trees that were planted in there. So a big issue for natural resources, a big issue for agriculture because of its ability to get into pastures and, and hay fields. But autumn olive um, is a kind of a weird plant in that it fixes nitrogen like a lot of bean plants do. Um, so it'll actually add, take nitrogen from the air and add it into the soil. Just kind of uh, unusual to have a plant that's not a bean to do that. And so it can grow in really, really poor sites. Right? So a lot of mine reclamation sites and things back in the day used to plant this um, because it could grow in those poor sites and then it's really spread out from there. Um, it has this kind of gray green looking leaves uh, if you flip them over, it'll have really bright kind of silvery uh, sheen to the underside of the leaves, which really makes it noticeable. In the fall, it'll have a lot of berries that are kind of rusty red colored uh, on it. And then in the early spring, it's done flowering now, but early spring, it'll have these little whitish yellow flowers that are so sweet smelling, it almost knocks you over. But um, grows in big patches, loves forest edges, um, and can take over those open areas. A lot of the uh, people around here, a lot of landowners will call this Russian olive. Um, around here, if they say Russian olive or autumn olive, they're talking about the same thing, which is this species right here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. So if you have gardening questions for us, feel free to start adding those to the chat box, and we will get to those today. My name is Candace Hart. I'm a State Master Gardener Specialist here for Illinois Extension, and I'm based here in Bloomington, and I love chatting all about flowers, which is our topic today, cut flower gardening and easy 
flowers to grow and we're going to talk about some other maybe not so great flowers today uh, too. But luckily I have some other great experts with me who love to talk about other topics in addition to, to flowers. So Ryan, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm Ryan Panko, horticulture educator out of Champaign. I cover Champaign, Ford, Vermilion, Iroquois counties in central Illinois. Um, and if you watched the show before, my specialty is kind of trees and woody plants, but I'm also a flower and pollinator lover. So I always love to chat about these kind of things. But um, enough about me. We have a special guest today. Uh, Christina, would you like to introduce yourself to the folks? And thanks for joining Hi. us. Hi, everybody. I am uh, Christina Lukin. I'm the horticulture educator serving Bonn, Clinton, Washington, Marion, and Jefferson counties in southern Illinois. And I love cut flowers. We have a a small cut flower farm at our own home farm. And I also love native plants and pollinators. So excited to be on to talk about easy care cut flowers today. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. So glad to have another flower person with me <laughs> with me today. <laughs> Always happy to do that. And I brought okay. some examples. So yay. yay. Good, good, good. The good stuff. Okay, well, like we said, guys, this is a question and answer show as well as a, a topic focused show. So if you have questions about cut flowers or flowers or anything else gardening related, feel free to add those um, to the chat box. But I think we're going to kick the day off uh, with Ryan talking a little bit more about some some flowers that have been in the news lately that maybe are not so ideal that we that we want to grow in our garden. So Ryan, take it away. Yeah, sure. So if you saw kind of our pre-show little thing, we were talking about invasive species there with Chris Evans. Mm -hmm. um, this is an invasive species that's been kind of in the news a lot. I've got a lot of calls about it here locally. Locally and, and some of it centers on a blog that I published last year about this time. But uh, poison hemlock is a plant that everybody's talking about. Um, it's a member of the wild carrot family. So um, there's a lot of other plants that have in that family that have similar toxic effects and things on us humans. But they're all kind of plants to be aware of. And, and they're really, um, I guess why it's come to the forefront is not only the sensational name it has, poison hemlock, mm -hmm. you know, but the fact that it is just all over the place. And I would say in the last 10 years, um, the population of this plant across the state um, has really expanded. And I, I don't really understand why. Um, I think a lot of us are noticing it more too, but I can just tell you from the places I've seen it, it it's, it's, it's growing in numbers. And so um, it's not, and I guess some of the confused, well, anyway, let's talk for a second about why it's harmful or why we should we should really be concerned about this plant. Yeah. Um, and you know, as its name implies, poison. It has a highly toxic uh, compound in it that is actually fatal to humans and animals if you just consume a little bit of it. Um, so famously, um, it was responsible for the death of Socrates by ex execution in ancient times. You, you know, so um, in ancient Greece. So I mean, it was it, it you know it was it was its toxicity was well known and it was used used for people on people in the past. Mm -hmm. So that's how we kind of know about it. Um, again, it's non-native. It's came from Asia, Asia, Europe kind of area, and has been brought here. I mean, you know, way back in the 1800s, it was brought to this continent. So it's not brand new, but for some reason, we're seeing more and more of it. Um, uh, the other thing that it can do, and we'll talk about this kind of with another wild carrot family plant in a minute, is um, it can cause phytophotodermatitis. So <laughs> phyto is plant, photo is light, dermatitis is just an, a reaction, a rash that's a reaction to something foreign. So like with poison ivy, we lots of us get dermatitis from that. We have a, you know, I've, I'm lucky, I'm not super mm -hmm. allergic to it. I've got to get a lot of it on me to get it. Um, I know other people that can just look at poison ivy and they get the dermatitis. So um, so anyway, what happens with uh, poison hemlock and some of the other wild carrot family uh, plant members is that they have a sap that contains this crazy chemical in it that gets on your skin. Um, your skin is exposed to UV. That's the photo part of this name. Um, gets exposed to UV and about a day, 24 to 48 hours later, you get this burning rash that's blistery and it's really painful can leave scars. I mean, it's a pretty serious skin rash. Yeah. Um, and people, lots of people don't know where it came from. You know, it's just this mystery. It's like, gosh, where'd I get this rash? They start thinking back and it's like, oh, you know, I was dealing with some weeds on the edge of the pasture two days ago. Um, and so it's really hard to link it to where you got the rash. Lots of people know it's uh, from one of these plants. Now, the thing with 
poison hemlock is that um, there's mixed information out there from reputable sources as to whether it does or doesn't have this phytotoxin, you, you know, this phototoxin. Um, what research would tell us is that it does contain that, but it varies widely by the plant, individual plant you're looking at, uh, the site conditions, and the stress of that plant. It's a, in, in response to stress, it will concentrate that. You know, it's a defense mechanism for the plant, essentially. It's an antifungal um, agent in the plant. You know, it fights fungal infections. Uh, so, you know, safe to say a stress plant in a mowed ditch probably has some of it. A plant that's just kind of happily growing in some area that, you know, hasn't had much interaction, maybe it doesn't. But, yeah. you know, I can tell you, I've been I've been up to my elbows in it before, and I've never got the rash from poison hemlock, and I kind of read the stuff that said you wouldn't. And so I've kind of wrote that off in recent years where I had to kind of reassess that as this all came to the forefront of the news. But um, real quick, let's why don't I share my screen and let's look at some pics so folks yeah. are wondering what this plant uh, looks like. They can get an idea. So you should be seeing a PowerPoint slide here. I hope I can kind of share my screen. Oh, I think I need to swip, swap displays. Uh, but here's a good look at, at poison hemlock. So you see on the left here, it's a pretty tall plant. You know, this, this vegetation here at the edge of this ditch is probably two feet tall. This plant's probably five feet tall or so. You know, when I was standing next to it, it was almost as tall as me, but it was down the ditch a little bit. So five, six feet tall. Uh, like many wild carrot plant family members, uh, it's got these light, airy, umbel structures. You know, they're, they're also called the umbilifers. You know, that's the, the name of that plant family because they're, they're umbels. They're these wide open structures. So uh, right now it's one of the few plants that it has these white flowers, it's tall. I've got a picture of an individual plant here. It's usually in a colony, usually see it in a big group. Mm -hmm. um, but really the ID feature that I try to get folks to key in on is this purple spotted stem. If you see on this, it's a smooth purple spotted stem with poison hemlock. Now, a close lookalike is Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot. Um, and that has just started to flower. I took this picture two days ago in Piatt County, and that's the first one I've seen of the year. Mm -hmm. um, it's a much shorter plant, a much bigger flower. Notice how much wider these flowers are. And then a lot of the flowers have this little like red speck of flower material in the center. But Christina, you've got another um, yeah. kind of, let me stop my screen share here because we've got another interesting kind of specimen to check out. Want to tell us this is a, a ornamental variety. So yeah, so this is you'll see this in some of the cut flowers. It's coming now. So this is Daria, and if you can see my screen, it's got more of that umble shape, um, but it does not. It it when it's in full maturity, whenever you're gonna see it in bouquets, it's gonna actually be um the umble shape with that burgundy uh, color to it. So it turns white, but then it matures into this uh, burgundy color. And the stem is, you know, very rigid and, and it umbles, the full umble. So that's what you're gonna see in it. And it's very safe. Um, it actually has sterile seeds. So it, it's gonna go ahead and you're gonna have to reseed it the next year. I've not had it where it's reseeded itself. So there's sterile seeds and they'll see those starting to come yeah. into like your farmer's market bouquets and things like that. And they're very safe. Yeah. As you can yeah, see, so, I'm using the, <laughs> as I'm seeing mm -hmm. the stem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, that's what I, I'm just showing uh, Queen Anne's lace just because it's it's often mistaken and it's really yeah. it's a pretty harmless plant unless you're going to ingest it. Then there's maybe some toxicity yeah. in the mm -hmm. um, in some of the parts of it. But um, anyway, so that's a close look alike. But again, shorter plant and it's just kind of coming into flower where poison hemlock's probably coming out of that flowering period. Uh, the last thing I want to share and um, it, this is this is wild parsnip. Um, and it's not as tall as poison hemlock. It's got this yellow flower. Um, it's all over the ditch banks right now. And, you know, these disturbed areas around the interstate, like I, I just drove 15 minutes down I-72 to get here to my office, literally saw thousands of plants of so both this and poison hemlock in the same place. So in the past, when folks have reported the chemical burn to me and we're trying to link it to plants, I've kind of found both of these plants in the same area. Wild parsnip is well known for the chemical burn in, in high levels of that toxin in its in its plant parts. Mm -hmm. So we we know it has it. Um, poison hemlock, it's variable. So, but this is one that I think lots of people don't even notice or are unaware of. It's just all over the place. And this is the one that I've really seen 
at least reports that have came to me, the, the most reports have been wild parsnip, more so than than poison hemlock for the chemical burn. So mm-hmm. be aware of this plant. Um, I, again, uh, you know, with poison hemlock to really, you know, be poisoned from it, so to speak, uh, you've got to ingest that material. It's got to get into your body. It's not going to, It's you're not like, you're not going to die from just brushing up against the plant. But uh, in dealing with all these wild parsnip, poison hemlock, we need to protect ourselves a little bit. You know, you need, you should be wearing long sleeves and gloves, um, long pants, you know, don't, just don't, don't get an exposure. If you think you get the sap on you, get inside and wash your hands or wash it off and you can start, you, you know, it's not an instant burn that happens. You, you've got a little bit of time there to get it off, but um, it's also a plant that if, you know, again, not, not going to be really popping up in your yard or your flower bed, but if you live in a rural area or on the edge of town, it can be on your property somewhere, probably need to take steps to control it because we don't want it to spread anymore. Um, you know, probably the worst stories I've heard are kids that have used poison hemlock stems as, as playthings, like as a blow, a flute, something they'd put in their mm-hmm. mouth and blow through. It's a hollow stem that's ingesting it, you know, Yikes, and, yeah. and I, I mean, possible fatality from that. And it doesn't take much of it. So, so, I mean, make your kids aware if you've got it on your property, get, take steps to get rid of it. And last thing I'll say is just a little bit about control on it. Um, all these plants are biennials. So we've all heard of annuals, you know, they kind of live for a year, die. Biennials live for two years. So the first year they're in a rosette stage, almost kind of like a ground cover. And in the second year, then they bolt. So they start to produce flower stalks, then they flower and produce seeds. So it's your control needs to be timed for what stage of growth that plants in. So when it's in the rosettes, well, and it's also important to understand this because if you have a patch of poison hemlock, you may have really tall plants, but you may have the one-year plants too that are kind of low and along the ground. And so look at the foliage, it's the sa- kind of the same on both and try to recognize the smaller plants as you're trying to control it. Um, but really once both of these plants kind of start to flower, especially once they start to set seed, they're not going to be responsive to a herbicide if you want to spray them. So that's important to understand. Like at this point, you're not going to get very good control with any kind of herbicide but before now or on the one year plants, uh, you know, simple glyphosate, you know, concoction it, like at one percent is pretty effective at killing it. But but now it's kind of shifted its growth um, right now with since that plant's flowering, it's expending tons of energy on flower production, on seed set. You can take a shovel. And, and again, because it's a biennial, it doesn't have that perennial root system established. You can take a shovel and dig it up and snap and break the tap root, make sure you cut, sever the tap root below the soil line. And really that does a pretty good job of getting rid of the plant because it's it's put so much energy above ground. I mean, it's getting ready to set seed and just die. So, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and do that before it sets seed, right? Before, yeah. it, before that seed matures. So yeah, stopping seed production is probably the key to long-term control. Absolutely yeah. don't let the stuff go to seed. Yeah. Um, with poison hemlock, I've had pretty good luck with just mowing it out of places. So mm-hmm. I got some, brought some soil in, seeded some turf in my front yard, and guess what was it? What what came up with my grass? <laughs> you know, some some poison hemlock. Well, I've just mowed that area and it's gone. Um, wild parsnip uh, is not as easily mowed out, and it sometimes tends to open up a little more light and promote the seed bank coming back when you mow. So it's a way to stop it from going to seed, but you're probably, you know, you're probably not going to control it very well. That seed stays uh, viable in the seed bank for a while, you know, through maybe three to five years or something, it's going to be coming back. So uh, mowing's not as good of a strategy, but if nothing else, if you can't do anything else, at least stop it from going to seed. But, you know, obviously if you're mowing, if you're throwing that sap out of your mower, have some have some long sleeves mm-hmm. and stuff on, or mm-hmm. you know sometimes you're on a mower where you're not going to have contacts. But um, but yeah, hand pulling is effective too. If you're going to time your hand pulling, you know let it flower, let it put all that energy in, pull it uh, before it goes to seed. But um, but yeah, that's kind of the story on these two. So th- those are the big ones to be looking out for and just be aware and stay away from them if if at all possible. So. Nice. Awesome. Well, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I know we we wanted to chat about this because, like you said, it's been in the news so much lately. A lot of yeah. a lot of information out there lately. People have been asking, do we report it? What do we do? So it's it's good to get that info out there. Well, that's a good point. Like um, as far as reporting goes, like 
I, I don't know if you're, you know, just like I said, I probably saw thousands of plants on my mm-hmm. driving work today. Yeah. Now, I don't know if reporting it's super <coughs> helpful because we were pretty aware that it's, you know, all over the place. Right. Um, but yeah. anyway, be aware. But and, and, yeah. and alert, let other folks know because I, I think a lot of people are actually pretty panicky that I'm talking to about this. Um, and it's, you know, it's something we need to think about, but uh, no need to panic and really. You know, not a huge threat to native plant populations. I mean, a high quality prairie set up, you know, it takes full sun. It's not going to handle a lot of shade. High yeah. quality prairie or somewhere else, it's not going to be competitive. It takes that disturbance, that mowing, you know, that mm-hmm. just human activities, you know, kind of bring it in. Um, so, anyway. Yeah. But. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Well, if anybody has any questions about those, let us know. Keep an eye out. We've got uh, Brian's blog post linked, and I know we've had a Facebook post too that has gotten a lot. Got a lot of attention out there too. So that's great. Okay. Let me see. I think we had a question over here on YouTube and then we'll get talking about some of the fun flowers <laughs> here next. The good ones. Uh, the good <laughs> ones. Um, let's see. Paul asks, is there a native goldenrod and an invasive goldenrod? How would I know the difference? That's a good question. Um, well, I mean, I can, you guys chip in if you have something to say on this too, but um, yeah, a lot of our native goldenrods are really kind of invasive, actually. Honestly, um, yeah. You know, and in in prairie restoration, like in, in true prairie restoration, it's kind of like you're managing for prairie plants, but not goldenrod a lot of times. Like, you know, common practice in natural areas is to go clip the seeds on goldenrod, so you're not having more come in because it will kind of dominate a prairie stand. So I think mm-hmm. probably what you're seeing is native goldenrods, which are good. Yeah, you know, they're really great pollinator plants, but in a prairie where you want a lot of diversity to support all kinds of insects and animals, uh, it's not good to just have a whole stand of goldenrod, and a lot of times mm-hmm. that's what prairies can go to if you're not careful. Yeah, and there are some new cultivated goldenrod varieties too especially for cut flowers you can there's some new uh, white flowered versions you can order ones that are shorter so if you uh, again who knows how much it would give to pollinators or probably they're certainly probably more sterile and probably don't offer as much uh, pollen and things like that but if you're looking for a (laughs) well-behaved kind of goldenrod there are newer varieties out there too so that's something to think about yeah good question good question yeah Okay, let's get into some fun flowers, things we we can cut and use in arrangements and and enjoy on our uh, on our kitchen counters. So we're going to talk about some kind of very easy to grow, I think, annuals to start with. And I see we've got some um, questions already too. So let's go ahead and get into those, and then I think we'll start showing some pictures and stuff. So um, Deborah asked a little bit earlier. Um, what are the best side dressing mediums for flowers and shrubs? So, Chris, do you have any good like fertilizer recommendations or kind of what you do on your farm at all? Yeah. So, I mean, if you're going to do it, if you don't want to go on to like the the liquid fertilizer, you know, Miracle Grow or, or doing that, uh, Osmocote, you know, you're mm-hmm. applying that. Um, or a good tint and tin, you know, putting that down. Um, those are pretty easily accessible. Um, we have done osmocote around plants, like especially in the raised bed, and that way then you don't have to really worry about them as they water them. It's just releasing that slowly. Um, in some, you know, your cut flowers don't always take, they're not huge feeders of nitrogen and everything. Once you get them flowering, you really want to watch that. And you don't want to get a buildup of phosphorus either. Um that happens, especially in those smaller containers or small areas. So you have to kind of watch for that. Yeah. So kind of lightly applying is, you know, probably the best approach on that side, <laughs> on side yeah. dressing on things, not to overly do it. I know uh, they do recommend when it's in full flower to give it a little bit more phosphorus, but typically in your home setting, you're not going to need that yeah. strong amounts. Yeah. Yeah, that's my usual go-to too, is some type of like granular that I can put over the beds kind of earlier in the season to give them kind of that boost in spring. And then I'll be honest, usually later in the season, I'm so busy that I don't even do do much additional fertilizing after that. And they do fine. I mean, they may, maybe they would have been a little bit more lush if I did, but it's not like it's a requirement. Um, But again, Always good to get a soil test, like we always talk about, to make yes. to to kind of know what you're starting with. But yeah, good question. Um, let's see. Amy had a question here too about cosmos. She says, 
Um, I raise them from seed and now it's in the garden, but not blooming. When does it usually uh, bloom? And Chris, I know you're talking about yours was not blooming yet either, right? Yeah, true. And, uh, you know, typically if you want it to have, it's definitely one of those that they even recommend if you're going to do multiple stems, like if you're going to use them to pinch them. Mm -hmm. So typically we're not going to see full blooms until July for us. Um, they're just coming up. I'm seeing the, the greens, but it's not in bloom yet. I haven't had any cosmos blooming quite yet. Um, maybe yeah. if they'd gone from seed, like it had reseeded itself in a, in a bed, you might have an early bloomer. Yeah. But if you're planting it, I, I think it's still a little bit early. I'm just now starting to see people posting and myself getting zinnias. So it's still, we're in June and we're thinking right. it's hot that we should be I know. having blooms. But it's still a little bit early for some of those that have been planted from seed. Hey, Perfect. real quick, could you just describe a little bit like pinching back? I think that's yeah. something that people don't always understand. A lot of folks do, but just, yeah. yeah, give a yeah. summary of that if you would. Yeah, so you want to pinch back to those. Um, so like Zini is a great one. And can I use an example? I'm I'm very visual. So Please do. <laughs> I'm very visual. So this is the, the first leaf set. So this would have been the second leaf set. You can see I kind of cut it a little long because it's one of those first ones. So you're going to go to that growth nodules right here where they had this leaf set, the second one, and pinch back to here actually on the plant. I cut it just a little longer. So I had a longer stem to bring today to show but you want to pinch those back and that will offset this new branching and it'll make it branching instead of going so tall it'll also promote those lateral branches and that will give you longer stems as you can see this would have been a really short stem uh, but I wanted it for display today for you guys so uh, but totally. this is where they would typically you would pinch this back and you'd have those two branches that come off and and you'll promote that but nice. you're going to want those nodules yeah. And that'll and that goes for a lot of the annuals you might be growing it for for cut flowers. Most of them it's a good idea to to do a pinch so that you're gonna get multiple instead of that one long stem, like you said, you're gonna get yeah. multiple, multiple stems coming off. And you typically wanna do that before they start to flower when they're still in kind of that leafy, um, herbaceous stage. Yeah. Yes. I think where I've done it the most over the years is on a perennial on mums. Yeah. Yeah. It yes. really does a great great job of getting those yes. nice and bushy. Right. And they'll totally. do that in um, amaranth, um, celosias, some of those branching. They'll do it in some of those annuals that way, especially for your fall nice. bloom and into summer, mm -hmm. late summer mm -hmm. blooms. Well, um, and and dahlias too. I need to get outside yes. one of these days and <laughs> pinch back my dahlias too because yes. they also. Cool. Okay. I think. We're caught up on questions, so keep them coming, guys. If you have questions about cut flowers or any other gardening topic, we are happy to talk about that today. But I'm going to go ahead and show my screen here. And then we're going to start um, talking about some of these um, uh, mostly annuals, I think we'll touch on, that are just, that could, we can recommend to you guys that are just very easy kind of cut flowers to grow. If you're new to cut flowers, you've never grown anything specifically for cut flowers. Maybe you've had these in your garden, but you've never kind of thought, oh, I want to grow some some specific cut flowers. We're, um, I've got some pictures. Um, she's got some samples there and we'll kind of talk about some of these um, great flowers to, to try. And most of these are going to be easily started from seed, which is also what makes them just very easy to, uh, to grow. So this first one here is that zinnia. That's what um, Chris was just showing us here um, a, a little bit ago with the pinching. And zinnias, of course, are great because there's a lot of colors to choose from. You can plant that seed. They germinate very quickly and they're going to get to a, a good size uh, pretty early in the season. So that if somebody asks, I'm starting out, what should I grow? Zinnias would probably, would you agree, Chris? Probably one of yes. the first ones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> first ones you'd absolutely. recommend. And, and they're definitely that you have different sizes and shapes and colors and they have borders and zinnias. There's just so many varieties that you can grow and, yep. and just enjoy them. They even have the candy stripe ones. So mm -hmm. the kids enjoy those. They seem to be a good one. Yeah, love that one. That's definitely a favorite. Um, straw flower is this next picture here. I've got a bed of those going this season. This is one not as common as zinnia. You may not uh, be as familiar with it, but man, is it a good cut flower and a great dried flower too. If you run your fingers over those petals, they're papery and crinkly. They're basically dry already on the, on the plant. So you can hang them upside down and they'll keep that color for... A long time. So that's straw flower. That's another great one to try. 
Celosias, we've mentioned that one. Lots, again, colors to pick from. Very easy from seed. And then you can also do the cool kind of crested varieties are always um, super fun, too. And one thing you'll find with not all, but some of these annuals is that they tend to reseed as well. So once you, you plant them, uh, you can kind of have a patch of them going um, kind of year after year. And that's certainly true of Celosia. I have Celosia coming up everywhere, <laughs> which can be good or bad, but it's a great, which means it's very easy to grow. Um, we've got Gomfrina. That's another globe amaranth. That's another great um, dried flower, a little bit shorter in height. So even if you just want to mix it in as like a bedding plant, it's great for that. And then you can just cut cut off of that. A lot of great colors to pick from. Yeah. Um, amaranths. I love amaranths. There's there's upright and there's hanging amaranths. Um, the upright ones are going to get pretty big, it's like five feet or so in height. So you, they need yeah. some space, <laughs> uh, right? And then the hanging ones tend to need a little bit of support because obviously they have a more kind of pendulous habit. But man, super cool flowers, cool colors to pick from. And I think Chris has some she can show us here too. And then we've been talking about Cosmos. Love Cosmos for that typical kind of daisy uh, flower that we're familiar with. This one you can see has many more petals than the typical variety. So it almost looks like a carnation, but you've got all that uh, typical kind of fern-like foliage of the of the Cosmos. So that one's also very easy from seed. And then we've got Rudbeckia. So many are familiar with um, the perennial uh, Rudbeckia, of course, from our gardens, but and the annual ones are also great and have give you more color options, bigger flowers. Uh, that's just big yellow ones here um, and just some really fun ones to, to choose from. Um, and then I grabbed a couple, let's see, what else did I grab from my garden quick? I grabbed uh, marigold, of course. Mine are just now starting to, uh, to come into flower. I love growing marigolds. And this isn't even the full, I could have gone a little bit longer, but the key with um, growing annual cut flowers is choosing your varieties um, well, because <laughs> you can grow, of course, your typical bedding plant, marigold, which will be six, eight inches tall. But this variety is going to give me more like 18 inches, 24 inches of stem length, which is much more what I want as a cut flower. Um, status is another really fun one that is also a great dried flower. If you can hear that rustling, it also is dry basically already. And then I had some ageratum um, too, which has a really beautiful blue uh, flower and some larkspur. Uh, and this is another one that just kind of reseeded in place from, from last year and, and off it goes. Uh, but Chris, I know you had some other ones in your vase too. Do you want to show some of your other favorite ones there? Yeah. So same thing. Um, I had some snapdragons and again, you know, it's the variety that you choose because there's bedding ones um, that have been sprayed, you know, with um, growth regulators to keep them the dwarf variety. Um, we raise, and this one's a little shorter, I just cut it to fit in the base, but um, the Rocket Series, and it's the really tall and Madam Butterfly. So mm -hmm. some of them have really cool, and then we love the fun little Snapdragon heads on them, right? So they're always fun. There's lots of different colors and varieties that we uh, selected, but that's a fun one. And that's a pretty easy one too. I think a lot of people can grow snapdragons mm -hmm. um, very well. Same way we did the Robecchia. Mine has actually got a green center. So nice. it's, it's the Irish eyes. So there's lots of different varieties, like you said, that can be used. Um, even, you know, we, we love the pollinators in our Angintone. So even our Echinacea, our purple cone flowers can be used. I've seen where they've been using those recently and even letting them go to the seed head. Uh, the petals fall off, they can use those. They'll yeah. even have those in there. And they've got those brilliant orange color centers that are kind of fun. Um, and then foliage is, you know, we, we we always think about sunflowers. We have some of those going. This one's just barely starting to open. But your sunflowers are very easy cut flower to be able to use. I even brought some, some foliages that you might have in your perennial bed that you don't think about that can be used. So one of them, as I pull everything and got stuck now, <laughs> is um, we have herbs that we use a lot. So this is actually oregano, the second year hmm. that's gone to flower. Um, so we'll we use oregano and you can see the leaves. And yeah, the pretty. Stem. 
That's cool. And then this one is our, um, of course, we love the texture and the tactile of our lamb's ear. And this right. has gone to seed. And so pollinators love this. It's a purple bloom on it. You can use those long spikes and you can see it's really long. So those are kind of just nice textures that you can add that are in your bed. And it might even be in your garden that you'll right. have in your oregano leftover that's gone to seed. Pollinators love it. I was There was a lot of bumblebees on there, a lot of natives. Um you know, bees on there. Uh, it looks like I've got a little bit of a spider hanging <laughs> off. So everybody loves it. Yeah. Never know what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. You get a lot. And then we have a, a few early dahlias. Again, like we were talking nice. about pinching. Um, you wanted that stem. This is a side branch. As you can kind of see a side shoot. Um, that gives you that nice long length to it. Uh, but this one is a uh, black satin. It's a little early. It's a dahlia. But you can tell you don't want those. You want these nice thin as uh, Candace will tell you. These nice thin stems. Right. To use. If they're great big giant stems, they're yeah. very hard to use and place. Um, when you're doing bouquet work or even you're just an arrangement for your table, it's really hard. So you want those nice thin stems. And so you want those side shoots. Love it. And then I think the, I, the other thing I brought, which um, again, I'm an herb person. I, I love herbs. So this one is in our community garden. Brian, do you know what this is? We're going to give him a test today. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> so this, this one is Artemisia. <laughs> So this is wormwood. They'll call it wormwood. Um, it'll have the flower that will come out of the, the top. But this is just the foliage, but it's a beautiful foliage to be able to use. You can see this one's a little wonky yeah, because it was around another plant, but they have these nice long stems also um, that we, can be used. And then we'll also use Dusty Miller um, that mm -hmm. typically would be a bedding plant, but you can tell they get really long stems and, and we'll use them. Um, we've even overwintered these in our on our tunnel um, and we've used them for just as, as a foliage, you know, to put along with, and it's just that beautiful um, silvery white color to it to, to add to your bouquets. Nice. I love when they get that yellow flower on it in that second year too. <laughs> you, yes. you don't see, you don't expect that to come on. <laughs> love it. Okay, cool. So a lot of fun stuff people can try out in the garden. And like you said, there, this might be the things that people already have in their garden, but maybe didn't realize, oh, I could actually cut that and use it in an, uh, in an arrangement. And I always encourage folks to just try something out. If you're not sure if it is a good cut flower, then um, cut a stem, bring it in, put it in some water and just yeah. see, see what it does, see how long it lasts. You, if Whether it's a day or seven days, you're still able to enjoy it for a, a period of time, which is, which is the idea. So yeah, I, I think that. that's what I always, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, obviously don't sell cut flowers or anything. Like we just do it to bring them in and have. Right. We, but yeah, you want, if you cut it, you want it to last a while. Are there some flowers that are or plants that just people commonly want to, but it's not a good idea because they only last a couple of days or mm -hmm. I don't know. Is there anything that falls in that category? I, I can't, haven't experienced it, but um, just. Yeah, kind of I, I think our, day, especially day lilies, everybody yeah. thinks, oh, they're beautiful yeah. blooms. And, and those are, I think everyone is so disappointed that yeah. they typically don't, you know, they, they're going to close up anyway. They may yeah. have different ones. Iris is probably is that, that next one that mm. typically everyone gets upset. It's only a couple of days that the, the bloom will last, but it will last. And if you break it off, the next bloom is behind. Um, yeah. It'll kind of go. But iris is kind of fall in that category. I think everyone's disappointed with an iris be just because of that reason that they don't last as long. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then yeah. and then you have some, you know, that like Lizzie if you're going to do a cut that lasts for 10 to 14 days yeah. and, and they're just a super long, uh, you know, survivor and base life. So. Right. Yeah. Lilacs is another one I think of too, yeah. that people like yeah. love to bring in lilacs as a cut flower and they yeah. always ask, what can I do to make it last longer? And it's like, <laughs> Yeah. They just don't last very, <laughs> last very yeah. long. Yeah. Good and another question. one, I think the the stage that you cut it in mm -hmm. um, also does that. So whenever um, you have your zinnias and and like you said, this you want to do that wiggle test on the stem mm -hmm. and make sure that it's not real floppy and it's not going down. Um, it, you know, you want to have that trigger, that real rigid stem. Otherwise, it's not going to last. It will. You'll pick it and you go, oh, I love it, and then it'll be drooped over the next morning. Um, so the, when you harvest is another key of how they're going to last hmm. in your base. Well, well, so on the wiggliness then, is that like a too too young of a stem or too old of a stem then that you're cutting? Too young of a stem. It's still okay. immature, and so it's not going to, not, um, yeah. 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 It hasn't built that pressure yet. To, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. 
And you'll find that with some, like if you're cutting some, maybe some foliages to put in an arrangement sometimes, if like that newest kind of most lush growth at the tips can wilt much faster than, than everything else. So, yeah. And Candice and I will probably tell you, this is a, a great stage that if you're going to want for the longest face life for your sunflower, if it's fully face open and all those petals are fully, ray petals are totally extended, it's not going to last very long, right? This is mm. the maturity of it being closed up and just barely breaking like this will be a longer base life right. uh, for a sunflower. And, and no one wants to pick it like this because they're like, oh, I don't, <laughs> it's not ready yet. Right. Because typically when you look at a picture of a sunflower, it's going to be fully open. And, and this is typically when we want to get the longest base life. Right. Yeah. And last show we talked about peonies because it was, it was peony yes, time. <laughs> so we talked about the marshmallow stage and harvest yeah. them when they're, they're just showing color before they're fully open so that you get the max, the max life of it. And some of that is, some of that is trial and error, error. If you're, if you're new to kind of cut flowers and you're not sure, cut them at uh, several different stages and, and see what, see what works. Cause there are some things where if you cut them too immature, then they're not going to open. They're just so they need to <laughs> need to yeah. mature a little bit longer. So some of it's trial and error too. Well, so I've definitely I've definitely made the sunflower error. Like <laughs> cut them when they're huge, but but right. then I've always been happy with how long they last. I thought yeah, okay, and you know, you know kids are super happy. They want the right. one that's as big as their head, right? <laughs> that's the first one they want to pick. <laughs> right. But it definitely, if you're looking at for the base life, like you question, it's definitely the longer base life that you're going to get in that. Yeah, that's cool. I'll, I'll switch that up now. Yeah, yes. and, and even being vegetable farmer, I mean, if you have basil, um, you know, yeah. you pick basil and you pick basil and then you're kind of tired of picking basil. <laughs> we've even gone to where we let it go to the flower stage and we've used that to bring in as a foliage mm -hmm. and cut. Um, purple ruffle basil is a beautiful purple foliage mm -hmm. and white blooms. And we'll use that sometimes later into the fall because you're tired of having of harvesting yeah. <laughs> and let it go. <laughs> right. It's great for pollinators. So you, we use a lot of herbs and mix in herbs into our bouquet sometimes. Love it. Awesome. Yeah, very cool. Cool, cool. Okay, I think we've gotten some questions coming in here. Let's see. Elizabeth asks, um, second year for lamb's ear, they're flopping over. Should I cut them back or will it harm the flowers? So I'm not, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Chris. Yeah. I'm not sure about flopping over right now. I know. I mean, I'm not sure if they're talking about the, the, the leaves. Are, uh, it may just be right now with the heat that they're yeah. just having a heat mm. response. Right. Um, yeah. I would say, I would durable, say that too. So I'm not sure what flopping over issues. Now I, I have seen like we're in here um, when we go to this stem, when they're starting to, to produce the, the stems, you'll these will flop over sometimes just because they get to that stage that, you know, like the side sheets may lean and you'll get leaning of them like bending right? because they're so heavy. Maybe that's what you're seeing. But as far as the plant itself flopping, I don't really typically see that as much. No, me, ne me neither. Yeah. But if, the, if it is the flowers, don't be afraid to cut those off and yeah. clean them up. Like I typically will go and do that after the, those pink kind of flowers and open up after those have faded. A lot of times I'll come through and clean those up just because it in the landscape, I think it looks a little bit better after yeah. they're done flowering. So yeah, don't be afraid Typically, like you said, lambs here is pretty hard to kill. So I wouldn't be afraid to wouldn't be afraid to cut them back if you need to. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, Kathy had a question about um, hibiscus tree. Hibiscus tree, does it need a bright sun? And I'm assuming there's perennial hibiscus. I'm assuming you're talking about tropical, more of the tropical hibiscus. What would you guys say to that? Bright sun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah, I would, would say, say, yeah, too. Yeah, I would say, too. For flowers, yeah. yeah. Yep, yeah, exactly. I think you would, it would survive in a maybe part sun location and yeah. be fine. But if you really want those big, bold hibiscus flowers, I think you're going to yeah. want bright sun. And if you are, if you're moving it, let's say you had it inside or in a shadier um, spot, just like with anything, go slow with it potentially so you don't sunburn yeah. um, anything. So move it to move it to the sun for a couple hours one day and kind of move it back and kind of do that a couple of days before you go straight to blaze, especially with 90 degrees outside yeah. <laughs> blazing, uh, blazing hot. Yeah. But I'd Good say question. the same answer. Okay, let's. 
I'd say oh, the same oh, answer sorry. holds up for the perennial hibiscus or Rosa Sharon is what I'm thinking of. It, yeah. It yeah. yeah. To have all the blooms. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Yeah. So. Yeah. Totally. Yep. Good point. Let's see. Marie had a question. Oak leaf hydrangea. When and how mm -hmm. do I prune it? Ryan, you want to take that one? Well, That's sure. So um, in my garden, it's blooming right now. So, you know, I've always got to think about this spring flowering versus summer flowering. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a spring mm -hmm. flowering plant. Um, and so then, you know, that's going to have the bloom right away. So that was a bud that grew last year. So correct, just correct me if I'm wrong here. I've always got to think through this. With yep. My yep. Um, and so um, you want to prune that or take those you, you want to do your cutting right now, right? As soon as it gets done flowering or you, you know, if you're cutting it for flowers, you'd be taking those and doing your pruning like right after that flowering period to preserve the flower buds because then it needs the rest of this growing season to put on next year's buds. Where if you, you know, we commonly prune woody plants with respect to health, you know, there's two different pruning objectives here mm -hmm. during dormancy. So um, when we prune during dormancy, we're just disrupting less of the plant's life. It's it's better for the health of the plant. Um, I tend to prune a lot of things during dormancy and don't care about the flowers for that reason. And if it's a stress plant, think about that. You know, you don't want to be, probably shouldn't prune a stress plant, I guess, in the first place. But if, if you're going to prune one that you think is stressed or it's not doing great, you need to prune a few limbs, like I'd probably sacrifice some buds to prune it in winter. But to preserve the buds, you're going to want to prune that, you know, very soon. Like once it kind of gets gets its flowering happening here so then again it has time to put those buds on before next year <coughs> um mm -hmm. you know that that brings up another um super great one um of annabelle hydrangea or the you know mm -hmm. the hydrangea arborescence all the different cultivars of that and i mean i was just looking at mine um just just in the last few days they're just looking spectacular full of blooms but i almost view that um harvesting some of those blooms off regularly like we do it just for you know for us like we do cut flowers just to look pretty on our kitchen table if we go to somebody's house for dinner we'll bring a cut flower thing and a mason jar yeah. to sort of keep it you know yeah. so we're we're really trying to cut those because if you've grown you know annabelle and some of those other varieties they want to flop and i feel like that's a good good way to keep them from flopping over as those stems get heavy if there's fewer of the heavy blooms there um but it it would be a spring flowering variety correct so it's yeah. yeah, it's flowering. Yeah. Um, it's flowering earlier as well. So you know, yeah. we've got to think about that with pruning and things. So yeah. um, I just kind of view that as like that's what that shrub's there for in my front yard. You know, to look pretty, but for me to harvest stuff. And I pretty much, you know, just from us harvesting things, do enough. I feel like it controls the flopping well enough. You know, I, I I've tried right. some of the. There's newer varieties, um, Incredible and Credible, like. All these different mm -hmm. ones that are kind of a play off that Annabelle variety. And um, yeah, maybe some of them do a little better with the flopping. I mean, I've got I've got Annabelle, kind of the traditional, and then I've got in Incredible. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I feel like Incredible probably does a little better at the, with the flopping, but it's also kind of a taller plant, I've noticed. It gets a little taller than my Annabelle's aren't quite as big. And so then mm. I, I've got them on either side of my front door. One section's Annabelle right at the base of our house. The other section's Incredible. Well, the stupid Incredibles now go too high up into the window, you know, where it's like, <laughs> I, and I just couldn't yeah. find Annabelle, you know, it's just not yeah. in, in nurseries anymore. Um, yeah. So yeah. there's give and take in all those varieties, but gosh, just beautiful flowers. Some of my favorites. Right. And, you know, and Ryan, when you say not to take too much of the plant, just leaving that good, you know, two thirds of the plants integrity so that they just, I think people tend to take too much at a time when they prune, they just think, yeah. you know, and, and that sometimes will stress it out. I think yeah. a little more than anything. To, yeah, totally. But yeah, but don't be afraid to, to harvest some too and enjoy it. Right, Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And Marie said it's a, speaking of her oak leaf, she said it's a huge old hydrangea. So I'd want to thin it and make it um, yeah. healthier. So yeah, after, after it's done flowering, then I think you'd be great to, to do that. Good question. Okay. Let's see. We had a question here from Liz. I found pink primroses in my garden and removed them after finding out that they were aggressive invasive. Is there a perennial or native that isn't aggressive invasive? Well, that's a that's a broad. <laughs> let us let us know, Liz, if you're looking for like a certain color or a certain look. Um, 
How about pinks? Chris, any other, any recommendations for maybe like a pink perennial that um, um, you'd recommend? Um, a Veronica or, you know, Speedwell, mm -hmm. something like that might be a pink. Um, yep. I was going to say, um, I love yarrow. I mean, yarrow can, yeah, can yeah. certainly kind of fill out too. I, yeah. And if you're getting the, the newer varieties, I wouldn't say they're aggressive, but they do. I mean, yeah. they fill an area, but yarrow would probably be one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, a still be. Oh, mm -hmm. I, I love a still be. It, they've got some beautiful pink shades of a still be that we use. Um, you know, I, if it's a shady area, you know, you're, you're looking at the coral bells or something that you know, yeah. might be there, but it, it yeah. depends on the location. I think that's the hard part too. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yarrow is beautiful. We have some yellows and they've, They've got some beautiful pink on that and, and just the traditional whites. There's so many different variations right now that they right. have. Yeah, I love yarrow. Or maybe some um, pink phlox too. Yeah. That might be good. I was trying to think of any other natives that are, well, purple coneflower, of course, has that. Right. Package. And then, of course, Joe Pieweed. I love Joe Pieweed. I know mm -hmm. it gets tall, but it is one of my favorites of the of this season. Yeah. We have a variegated one and, and also just our traditional. So Joe Pye is great uh, to have. Hey, I was thinking about Minarda. Nice. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely pink. Oh, yeah. Pink. Yeah. That's a yeah. good one. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Well, hopefully that helps Liz give you some other uh, pink ideas to, mm -hmm. to think about. Um, let's see. We've got a question over in YouTube. Um, what size should they get before I transplant outdoors? And can I transplant throughout um, the season? And did I cut out there? I know my internet was... Yeah, just a little bit. Or did what, you get that? What was okay. the plan? You said Basically, bring it out. Uh, Rudbeckia. So what okay. size to transplant Rudbeckia outside? And then can it? Can you transplant throughout the season? Chris, what do you do with your Rudbeckia? Uh, yeah, so we've taken, I mean, we've done in fall, like, you know, pull apart and, and divide some. They're pretty hardy. Um, I mean, I, I would say we definitely, you don't want to have it to be a flower and have all that energy. Typically, you want to leave it in that four inch or upper low to kind of start it out in the spring. Um, even when you're doing seeds, we've done it from seeds or little plugs too. Um, I think through the season, you want to leave it as it's blooming, but we've divided it again then in fall and, and transplanted it and had success with that. So I think, um, you know, just the heat of the summer is really, it just stresses everything as it's blooming uh, for annuals I, and and even perennials, I think you're kind of seeing. So you just kind of have to watch it because you already have to really take a extra care to make sure you're watering it. Yeah. And, and this week, of course, is very extreme, right? So <laughs> yeah. everything is seeing a lot more stress. I think you're seeing a lot more stress on things this week and, yeah. and, and into maybe next week that you typically wouldn't see this early in the season. Totally. So, you know, that's, that's a difference of this year. But well, I think... I think if, if you do it spring and fall, you're going you're going to have success with Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I usually just do a spring uh, spring crop, and I found them to be. You get a little bit of a cut and come again after you harvest. You'll get and talking about the annual Rebecca, yeah. you'll get a, a, another kind of flush of shorter stems that are still uh, usable. So yeah, I usually start inside uh, as small kind of plugs and then transplant them out to raised beds in the in the spring. But and the, the, some of the varieties will come back, you know, and they'll reseed it. Yeah. And, and yeah. so you might be able to move them at that point, you know, if you yeah, need them totally. moved out. Well, so I don't know about both of you, but um, I know this week I have like totally tested all my sprinklers and watering. <laughs> right. I had about 11 o'clock last night messing with hose connections. And <laughs> like, gosh, I need to get this stuff organized. Right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it's been a struggle this week to get water to all the places I need it because I'm, I haven't. Everything's disorganized from last. Right. Year. Uh, same here. Same here. I had what a sprinkler. Happened? I had one that was not working. So I'm like, oh boy, better go get. <laughs> now is not the time for this to not work. <laughs> and and then that everybody'll be short supply on hoses and right. watering cans and everything. Exactly. <laughs> right cool. Okay. I think we are caught up on questions. So keep them coming, guys. We've got about 10 minutes left. If you have other um, questions, we'd be happy to uh, to answer those. But um, Chris, any other tips? Like, let's say someone did want to start a kind of a designated cut flower garden. What would you recommend to start with? Would you, how would you get started? What do you think would be the best place to, to get started? 
Yeah. I, I mean, if they're going to do a cup flower, definitely going with, again, the, the zinnias, the cosmos, getting some of those, uh, you know, plants. And, and I guess it would depend too on um, you want the stem length, but you also what height there is. You don't want to put it like Ryan said, right in front of the window, right? We mm -hmm. want to think about the size that we're going to have in the spacing. Um, we will put, uh, typically we'll put zinnias pretty close so that as they grow, they will pretty much take over and suppress the weeds. Um, so we'll mm -hmm. put them, as you kind of seen in the areas, you can put them pretty close together uh, within four to six inches and they'll fill out, uh, they'll get that. But you you have to be cause of the height that you're going to get on some of those, especially late mm -hmm. season um, height on those. Uh, again, your cosmos are going to get a little taller. So it, it's where you're going to be at, you know, in your area that you want to do. Um, having a good soil drainage, right? Everything, they are a little more drought tolerant once they get going, but mm -hmm. you, know, you're, you want to have well-drained soil. They don't want to have wet feet. Um, I will say that zinnias are great in the beginning of the season, but you're going to think about late season. As they continue, you're going to see a little more of um, chances of powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to have a little issue of fungal issues. Um, they'll have leaf spot a little later into the season. So if that's something right in your front of your house, you may not want that there. You may want mm -hmm. that in a designated area. So thinking about as it continues to grow, is that going to be the right choice for me is another big thing. Right. Uh, Purple cone flowers, you know, things that are going to come back may be a better choice in that in that instance of it. Um, you know, using throughout uh, again, using some of your foliages, like what are you going to use? That might be a choice to add in there. Uh, marigolds, they have white marigolds, so it may mm -hmm. be that you have a certain color um, schematic that you're wanting to use. If you're wanting purples and whites, making those selections based off of color. Um, mm -hmm. If you're, you know, that may be some choices that you can choose it on your cut flowers also. And then, it, you know, what, what time of the year are you wanting to harvest? If you're wanting it early spring, things are early summer, things that are going to be in bloom, you, you want those choices. You can still start stuff right now, like your celosias that'll last for fall into the fall season. You know, with your pumpkins and mums, um, you could add slosias, you could add some amaranth, you could add globe, uh, you know, the globes will the last, the straw flowers. Um, you know, you're getting late, but you'll have some late blooms that you could start seed now and add and then have those into your fall uh, decorations and having pumpkins out there, add a few mums, and they'll still be beautiful and bloom and you'll be able to cut them to use. So I think it just totally. depends on what color and what 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 your purpose is for the cut garden. Right, exactly. Yeah, I I was kind of late getting a lot of my stuff out this year, so I'm in this weird like uh, lag of flowers between all of the <laughs> awesome spring stuff I had and now waiting for like all of these summer annuals to start blooming as the as the season goes on. So yeah. that's my plan next year. Is like okay, I need to work on some other kind of late spring, early summer things that I can kind of have have ready to go. And that's always something I'm thinking about. So, yeah. And, and it's just that this year was wet and rainy. Yeah. And so, and then that turned hot. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you're seeing a little delay of getting stuff planted. And then now it's so hot that it's so stressed that right. they're, they're lagging a little bit. So um, typical blooms, like the sunflower is just getting started. We had a late planting of sunflowers. You can still plant sunflowers oh, yeah. all the way through, you know, the summer. And that's something um, we planted some teddy bear sunflowers. They're two, they get to be about 24 inches tall whenever they sit. So having those short varieties, those little uh, can go in there in a cut flower bed and kids love them. They're, mm -hmm. they have a lot more ray flowers or just this really cute little round, um, you know, flower head that has all these and the kids love to harvest that you know they're short um there's different ones that you know you can kind of taper those down in size if you need to and that will help yeah. nice love it okay i think we had one last question come in here okay mary has a pest question so we'll see how we do <laughs> on this one um i'm seeing a lot more tiny red clover mites around my vegetable garden more than previous years. Should I be concerned or just let them be? Hmm. Red clover mites in the vegetable garden. Ryan, hmm. do you have any insight? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't dealt with that. So um, it's I, a, have, I guess an insect on red clover. I don't know. I, yeah, I've yeah. I've certainly, I'm, yeah, I'm not an insect expert. So I'm not even going to. 
Um, yeah, Mary, maybe we'll have to get you some more info on that because, yeah. No, yeah, no, I uh, might be blissfully gardening away right next to that problem. Yeah, right. That's my vegetable garden. I don't know. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm only, I'm most familiar with like spider mites, which mm -hmm. can certainly kind of cause some damage to the leaves and kind of stress the, stress the plants out. But yeah. yeah, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with these mites. And if they're, but I would say if you're noticing, if your leaves are still looking healthy and you're not really noticing any damage from them, I probably wouldn't be too, yeah. too concerned, but. Yeah, we may be able to get you some more info on that if you need to. Yeah. Okay, let's see. I think, yeah, I think we've caught up on all the questions. So everybody, thank you for your awesome questions today. Um, um, Chris, any final thoughts on recommendations for folks for cut flowers or anything we didn't get to that you want to... Want yeah, to share today? I, I definitely think try, you know, it starts small. Like you said, start out with those easy ones that Candace kind of had showed and recommended your zinnias, your cosmos. Um, just be thoughtful of, you know, you can incorporate these in with your perennials, some annuals in there. You can use perennials um, into your beds and just think about the height requirements and spacing requirements. Um, you're wanting to have good airflow so that you reduce mm -hmm. that any pathogens or anything that, you know, that might be causing some issues later into the season. Just think about not packing them real tight, right? We always want to mm -hmm. overdo because they're tiny. When we start planting and we go, oh, they'll have plenty of room. I'm, I'm <laughs> I like the worst about, you know, making right. sure I, I, I really read those labels and, and, and you'll know, get those spacings correct uh, just because of that reason. You, you will have, you know, more blooms and, and have a beautiful, you know, asset to your garden. So definitely try that and and think about maybe adding a new one that we talked about today that you maybe haven't used in the past. Yeah. Um, it's still plenty of time to add to your garden and and use those herbs. I love herbs. Right. To use those. So definitely you may have those already. So don't be afraid to use them uh, throughout the season. Awesome. Good tips. Okay. And it looks like there's one final question I missed. So we'll do that quick and then we will... Um, sign off for the day. Mary asked earlier, um, our oak leaf hydrangea, so another oak leaf question, mm -hmm. has a lot of new starts coming up and she said maybe suckers. Um, how difficult is it to take an oak leaf hydrangea sucker and start a new tree? Has anyone mm -hmm. done that with much success? I sure haven't. How about Well, I haven't done guys? it with oak leaf hydrangea, but pretty successfully with Annabelle hydrangea um, with a lot of the shrubs that yeah. send out that kind of suckering root system. So I would think you should expect to have a little success if you have, you know, if you pick one of the bigger suckers. Yeah, as long as you can um, dig it out and have a fair amount of roots uh, attached yeah. to it, I would think you'd be yeah. fairly successful. Yeah. And, and I think that's the key, you know, like it, I think there's times that I try and dig one and I don't get much of a root with it. And I just kind of know, you know, this one's probably not going to. Not great. Right. Yeah. So yeah, if you can get something with a little bit of roots attached to it, I think I think it would go for you. I think it's good, right. worth a try. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, guys. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for your awesome questions today. If you do have questions that come up between our shows. Um, definitely check out our Facebook group. We'll have the link in the chat there. We have an extension horticulture uh, Facebook group where you can post photos, you can ask questions, get feedback from other people. It's really great. And then we will be back next month in July. I think we're going to be talking about gardening with birds. So looking forward to that. So thanks everybody. Thanks Christina for joining us. It was great having you and we will see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.